Wax Highlights, and here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Hello there and a warm welcome to our Highlights edition, shaping up this time with the following top reports. Fun with facades, we check out the latest works from British artist Alex Chinnick. Rural writer Ulla Lena Lundberg of Finland gets her inspiration from her island home. And illusion adventure, we go on safari in this picturesque region of Spain. Well, he's touted as the guy who makes houses melt, slide, turn upside down and even float. Alex Chinnick is a 30-year-old British installation artist who's fascinated with structural elements and with tricking the eye. His latest project is presently on show in London in a prime position at Covent Garden. Take my lightning but don't steal my thunder. We'll only be around for a few weeks, but for anyone lucky enough to have seen it, its fleeting playfulness is sure to stick. Optical illusion or architectural masterpiece. The entrance to the indoor market in the London district of Covent Garden. But there's nothing concrete about this construction. Broken apart in the middle, it seems to float weightlessly in the air. This installation by the British artist Alex Chinnock is somewhere between installation art and architecture. With my work, it's very playful, but what I try to do is make the everyday world extraordinary and by taking familiar materials, situations, scenarios, and buildings and elevating them into a kind of realm of fantasy, um, I guess I try to create an experience that's positive that can be enjoyed by as many people as possible. His aim is to address people who don't normally go to museums. Concealed metal scaffolding links the bottom and the top of the building. Fourteen tons of steel went into this construction. The preparations took eight months for an artwork that will be taken down again by the end of October. I think it's very original and people stop and look at it and wonder what's going on. The idea that this is sort of like playing on the fact that it's an old ruin when in fact that it's um, a modern piece of art sort of an installation is quite an interesting uh, juxtaposition. It's striking enough to be preserved, isn't it? You know? and, uh... Whether in a, uh, you know, in an outdoor exhibition at a gallery that has a sufficient space for it, that would be good, you know. The unifying concept behind the majority of Chinex works is the idea of transience. He's just finished this building in London. It's made of wax bricks that will slowly melt away day by day. This office building has been turned upside down and will ultimately make way for a new one. Chinnick also has transformed residential buildings. This one in the southern English town of Margate has stood empty for 11 years. Its facade now appears to have slipped into its front garden. The work cost around 120,000 euros, yet there are no plans to refurbish or sell it. It's slated for demolition. I was excited by this idea that this area was once very affluent and the architecture is very grand, therefore. However, um, its recent economic struggles have meant that the facades of the building were all incredibly fatigued. And so it was this nice kind of juxtaposition that I thought sat well with what I was trying to do. Art in place of creeping decay. In the east end of London, Alex Chinnick went to work on an old warehouse. 1,200 pieces of glass were needed to create the illusion that all 312 windows were shattered in identical fashion. The artist himself lives and works in an old factory. He studied painting, but most of his projects have something to do with architecture. They're financed by donations from construction companies or individuals. Chinek's work requires a great deal of management. The aesthetic decisions are such a small part of the process. Um, and so often I, I, I don't feel like an artist. Um, I, I feel it's almost business and it's a long, long process of negotiation. So these things have to go through planning permission, um, and we had to discuss that with the local councils. The installation in Covent Garden is the first time that Alex Chinek's work has appeared right in the center of London. Internationally famous artists have already exhibited here, artists such as Jeff Koons, best known for his balloon animals, and Damien Hirst, seen here helping out at a kid's art project.
For Alex Chinnick, the installation marks the high point of his career so far. This project has been um, the hardest thing I've ever done. And I guess in many ways, therefore, it's, it's a momentary um, reward for the hours put in, I suppose. And that, 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 that feels fantastic. Um, also, it's nice for my grandmother to see me in the newspapers. And it's not just his grandmother who's taking notice, but also scores of passers-by. Alex Chinek's work is becoming a real tourist attraction in its own right. Well, it was back in the month of June that we moved to our new location here at Berlin's Pariser Platz with the city's famous Brandenburg Gate as our backdrop. And right over there in the corner, you can see our studio with its picture window. Well, to mark that move, we launched a photo contest and asked viewers to send in a picture of themselves with a striking landmark from their hometown. And we were delighted with the response. And it wasn't without some difficulty that our jury chose this one as the winner. Now that was Zea Contreras in front of Manila Cathedral in Manila in the Philippines and the photo is courtesy of her brother Ron. Well her prize was a four-day trip for two to Berlin and of course a visit to Euromax Central. Zea Contreras and her brother Ron in the middle of Berlin. Their flight from the Philippines to the German capital took 12 hours. This is the first time here for both of them. Finally, I've made it. Berlin's a big city and it's a beautiful city. I can't believe I'm finally here. Zaya has been learning German for three years. At home, she studies European languages. She's especially interested in German history and culture. Their first stop is the Berlin Cathedral. The Berlin Cathedral draws lots of tourists. Its history goes back to the 15th century. Since then, it has been altered again and again, partially destroyed and rebuilt. With a total height of 116 meters, it is Berlin's tallest house of worship, but not as big as Zea had hoped. I thought everything would be a lot bigger, but it's certainly very, very pretty. The East Side Gallery at the former Berlin Wall is Zaya's second destination. After completing her studies, the 25-year-old wants to go into the tourism industry and gain experience working abroad. She'd even like to live in Berlin. Even the weather doesn't bother her. I think Germany is great because the people are really friendly and it's not stressful. The weather is always good, it doesn't rain. We're learning about the place's history too. I'm interested in history. Third stop, Brandenburg Gate. Zaya has seen it in many photos. Now she can touch it and even walk through this landmark, whose ties to the history of German reunification are unparalleled. She wants to take a special photo here to take home as a memento, a reenactment of the picture that won the Euromax contest for her. The high point of the tour, a visit to the new Euromax studio just around the corner. Euromax host Christina Sturz personally welcomes the brother and sister and gives them a glimpse of what goes on behind the scenes at Euromax. Since the middle of June, Euromax has been broadcasting from its new studio at Pariser Platz. Today, Zea and Ron experience what goes into a Euromax production and not just the finished show. The 25 year old contest winner has a chance to play presenter herself. Hello and welcome to Euromax. My name is Zea and I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> I hope you had fun and that you learned a lot in the studio. I didn't expect the studio to be so big. I'd only seen it on TV, but now I've seen it up close. And the presenter was really nice. 
Their last item is the Festival of Lights. For 10 nights this month, light artists are illuminating more than 70 buildings. For Tsea and Ron, the day ends at the Concert House on Gendarmenmarkt. I can tell you that I really had a perfect day. I saw so many wonderful sights and met a lot of great people. I'll take home the really great experiences I had here in Berlin. Tsea and Ron Contreras now return to their home city of Boulacan in the Philippines with a suitcase full of Berlin impressions and memories. Well, now to the annual Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the biggest trade fair of its kind, and this year its featured country is Finland, allowing readers here in Germany to get to know a slew of Finnish authors. Well, one of the most successful in recent years is Ulla Lena Lundberg. She's long since been a literary star in her home country, but her latest novel, Ice, has just been translated into German. And so we went to see where she gets her inspiration on the Åland Islands of her childhood. The islands of Idor and Churka are in the southeast of the Orland archipelago between Sweden and Finland. They are a great source of inspiration for the writer Ulla Lena Lundberg. Here she engages in her second biggest passion too, bird watching. I have really done a bird list for Churka every year and finding a new bird here is better than finding a new bird anywhere else. Ulla Lena Lundberg has spent time in the United States, Japan and Africa, but the Orland Islands still have their grip on her. The writer spends every summer on Churka Island, which has 250 residents. She writes books in Swedish about life on Churka. Although the islands are in Finland, Swedish is an official language because of the Swedish minority. This is where she was born and spent part of her childhood. I always knew I wanted to be a, a writer, or since uh, I was four years old and my sister happened to tell me that those books I thought were just sort of organic matters like stones and sticks, and she told me that those stories that we so loved were actually written by people who were called authors. And uh, for some reason I was ashamed to tell people that I wanted to become a writer. Uh, so um, for a long time I used to say I would become a sea captain. Lundberg has written more than 20 novels and non-fiction books. In 2012, she memorialized Turkar with the novel Is, soon to come out in English as Ice. The novel was an instant bestseller in Finland and won the renowned Finlandia Prize. Critics praise it for its vivid descriptions of nature and people. There's a lot of ice in the book when you think about it. You see the ice as a glorious occasion when the communication between the islands are suddenly so easy. People just uh, go there skating or taking a sledge or something like that. And there's almost a festival sense about the time when ice makes communications easy. And then, of course, you have the lethal side of the ice. So, in fact, ice plays a big, big part in the book. The main character of the novel, a young pastor, comes to the island with his wife and young daughter in the mid-1940s. Their hopes for a new life are suddenly dashed when the ice cracks under the pastor's feet and he dies. The island in the novel has a fictitious name, but the places described actually exist, for example, the Franciscan monastery and the rectory where the family lives. That's the house where Ulla Lena Lundberg was born in 1947 and where she lived as the daughter of a pastor. It's a very familiar place, so you have to remember that I have spent all my summers here, and not in this house, but on the island with the people. And um, uh, I think that knowing that you were born here, that you spent your first years here, gave you a kind of... Uh, uh, footing. I still have this strange desire to welcome people who come in here because <laughs> I think in some way I have, I have a stake. I have a stake in it. And, and yet, you know, I'm very willing to share it. Ulla <laughs> Lena Lundberg often spontaneously guides visitors around her island. Ice makes use of the author's own experiences. Like the pastor in the book, her father died in the ice when she was a year and a half old. 
To me, my father was always a fictional character because I have no personal memories whatsoever. And this is why I insist that the book is, of course, pure fiction. And um, I think I work like every other writer does. I take what I take my own material and make something else out of it, which is fiction, a novel. Today, Ulla Lena Lundberg lives most of the time near the Finnish capital, Helsinki, but she still feels closely tied to the Orland Islands and their inhabitants. Next summer, she'll be coming back again. Johann Lafer is an Austrian chef whose television cooking shows have made him one of the most popular cooks in Germany. And while haute cuisine is his usual beat, he's also very concerned about healthy eating. And so three years ago, he started a project called Food Education, with which he hopes he will be able to teach school kids the basics of a balanced diet. And now he's taken some of those kids to New York City for a fast and a fun food tour. <laughs> A gourmet chef can also enjoy a hamburger. First up for Johann Lafer and his students, a New York burger joint. Together, they want to get a taste of typical American fast food. You can say that this is the real US of A. There's just as much variety as ever, but too many carbs like French fries and bread together. The meat could use a bit more seasoning, a bit more sophistication. Lafa doesn't just want to do a tasting tour, but also helps out. And he gives the cook a few tips. He's looking to be a role model for tasty and healthy food. If you go to a place like this and someone gives you a hamburger, you don't know whether it's been freshly made or not. But when you come into the school cafeteria and it smells delicious, you know it's fresh. Lava has been promoting healthy and sustainable school meals since 2011. That's why he started the pilot project Food Education at this secondary school in Bad Kreuznach. He compiled balanced menus with local produce for the school canteen. Sometimes he even cooks himself and teaches the students the basics of a healthy diet. We cook everything fresh every day and try to show the kids how to get excited about good flavor. In New York, the students are really excited about exploring the city. But a culinary tour is more to Lafa's taste. In the Wall Street area, he comes across the city's food trucks. The concept is gourmet fast food for discriminating tastes. It's a crazy world. An enormous hamburger and here organic potatoes with a honey rosemary dip. I don't know how this is supposed to go together. Still on the lookout for authentic Chinese food, Lava finds this eatery. He has to stand in line for half an hour to get in. Okay. Johan, yeah? come inside. Yeah. But the wait is worth it. Surrounded by trendy New Yorkers, Lava tries traditional Chinese dumplings. It's a universal language, pleasure. And it's fascinating to see what people around the world like to eat, where the tradition comes from, and how it arose. That's the biggest challenge for me. That's why he takes a closer look at the ingredients the next morning. Together with his German students, Lava even discovers a farmer's market among the skyscrapers of Manhattan that offers organically grown vegetables and fruit. New York is so, cool. New York is so big. You can come here again and again and always find something new. It's different, but Germany is home. And that's where everything tastes best. They say what the farmer doesn't know, he won't like to eat. Things are a bit different here. People are more open-minded. They like to try what's new, and some things become popular. And I think that's great. Lafa hasn't just shown others how to cook. He's come away from New York inspired by its cuisine. 
and also collected new ideas for his food education project. Well, finally, the region of Andalusia in southwestern Spain is renowned for its sherry production, its passionate flamenco, and of course its overabundance of sunshine. Tourists also flock here to visit the wealth of historic cities like Sevilla and Cadiz. But there's also the wilder west of the region and a stunning national park where early risers are often rewarded with some rare sightings. It's early morning in Andalusia in southern Spain. We've come here to the Coto de Doñana National Park. It's the workplace of biologist Jose Juan Shans Pusada. He has the job of monitoring the park's biodiversity. The national park is at risk of drying out because farms have been drawing heavily on the groundwater. The area's rich flora and fauna are at risk. Bueno. Doñana was declared a national park in 1969. The park is very important for bird life. The region is a wetland. Many migratory birds from northern Europe spend their winter here. And the region is famous for its diverse ecosystems. There's bogland and bush. It's even home to the lynx. The Iberian lynx is on the brink of extinction. Today, the biologist is lucky enough to spot two of them hiding in the undergrowth. There are only a few hundred left in Portugal and Spain. The majority live here. At the edge of the national park, Javier Hidalgo is busy training. At 62, he's one of Europe's oldest professional jockeys. He started riding when he was a small boy. Riding is a traditional pastime here. It's a gentleman sport, it's a sport of kings. Well, I think if we have a country that traditionally needed a horse to, to move across it. Not far from the national park is the town of San Lucar de Parameda. It's renowned for its historic buildings. Like the 15th century Castillo de Santiago. And for its sherry bodegas. One of the oldest sherry producers here is La Gitana. The winery is owned by Javier Hidalgo. There was a, a tavern in the harbor of Malaga uh, where a, a gypsy lady was serving the, the glasses of, of our wine to the, to the fishermen. So the fishermen ended up calling the wine El Vino de la Gitana, which means uh, the wine of the gypsy lady. Manzanilla is a dry fino sherry. It's made from grapes which are picked and processed before they're ripe. That creates a very special flavor. Manzanilla tastes salty. And that's why it's called manzanilla, because we, uh, manzanilla is a Spanish word for um, chamomile. On the nose, manzanilla shows the seaside aromas. One of the most interesting cities in Andalusia is Cadiz, with its 18th century cathedral, Catedral de Santa Cruz. Also, its narrow alleyways. And its traditional tapas bars. As darkness falls, the streets of Cadiz come alive with music. The region is famous for flamenco. I grew up between flamenco and the Sinti and Roma. Flamenco is everything to me. It's the way I pass time, the way I relax. Flamenco is my life. The dancing and singing go late into the night. 
and it's been that way for generations. The people of Andalusia are very proud of their traditions. Well, whether you want to catch up on a whole show or just review a fav favorite report, don't forget about our website at dw.de slash English slash Euromax. And with that, it is time for us to sign off. So bis bald und zum nächsten Mal und auf Wiedersehen.